Hello friends, and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast. We need a paradigm shift if it comes to our economic and social systems. Let us drive this change together. The Just Another Mindset podcast shares inspiration and tangible techniques on how to create seismic shifts in an outdated system, collectively and for individuals alike. My name is Ismail, and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or theme that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life. Get encouraged by listening to successful thought leaders, inspiring individuals and impressive change makers. Change from within will last and create positive results for all of us. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. Kate Handley is the executive director of the Biodiversity Law Center, a non-profit law clinic whose vision is flourishing indigenous species and ecosystems that support sustainable livelihoods in Southern Africa. In this episode, we talk about environmental law and justice. Kate shares which role nature plays in her life and why it is so crucial to fight for our declining biodiversity. You will learn about the interdependencies of nature with basically everything and we elaborate on particular cases that are made for planet Earth. We discuss ways on how to reconnect business with nature and what power law has in regard to creating massive changes. Finally, we discuss the role of being a consumer and citizen and how you can influence biodiversity loss. Wonderful. And with that, Kate, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you today is how do you feel and what is on your mind? That is a loaded question today. <laughs> It's been a day of a lot of things happening, but I am feeling generally positive and excited to be contributing to your podcast, having listened to a few of your previous podcasts and really enjoying the content. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for that, Kate. And yeah, I thought it makes sense that we give a little bit of a context for our audience in order to introduce that I would be very interested Kate what role does nature play in your life nature has a significant role in my life um, I would say that it shapes not only who I am in my personal life but certainly who I am in my professional life um, it's something that I've actually only come to later in life as well uh, when I was when I was growing up I was aware of the natural world, but I grew up in a big city, Johannesburg, and my family wasn't exactly outdoorsy or um, nature oriented. So besides the garden at home, there weren't many opportunities to go hiking or camping or exploring the great outdoors. Um, but this is something I, as I say, discovered when I, when I got to university um, and specifically in 2011, when I took a year off and traveled South America, accessing some of the most staggeringly beautiful landscapes and mountains and deserts. Um, and just, I think, a passion that had been there all along ignited. And so, I mean, just to fast forward to today, nature is a huge part of my life. I work as an environmental attorney, which I'm sure we'll get into in this podcast, but um, it's where I really go to recharge um, in, my, in my private time. So most days I will find some way of accessing the mountains or the sea. I'm incredibly blessed to live in Musenberg in Cape Town um, with the beach and the mountain within walking distance from my home. And I really find nature to be this completely life-giving force in my life and from where I derive my inspiration and my enthusiasm and my drive to do what I do for a living. Mm, thank you very much for sharing that. And indeed, we're going to talk a little bit about the you being an environmental 
lawyer, and I would be very interested, Kate, what does justice mean to you? Justice means all people being treated equally, and those that are the most disadvantaged shouldn't bear disproportionate burdens of socioeconomic factors in society. And I mean, I'm thinking here particularly around environmental justice and the fact that all people should have equal benefits derived from the environment and from the natural world. But likewise, those that are least advantaged shouldn't bear the brunt of environmental degradation as so often happens. So it's about achieving, achieving that balance. And was achieving that balance also your main motivation to study law to begin with? Or when did you create a desire to study law and yeah, to become a lawyer after all? Oh, it's such an interesting one because I actually didn't mean to study law. I kind of stumbled upon it. <laughs> it wasn't, I, I actually wasn't motivated by any legal um, or wanting to study law in particular. I went to university bright eyed and wanting to be a journalist to report on impactful stories um, in the world. And I ended up spending a few lectures in the journalism faculty and realizing this was absolutely not for me. Um, so fast forward a little bit, I, I changed tack and took on some um, humanity subjects, including law and a love of law and its role in society and how it is such a powerful tool for achieving change really um, motivated me to to study further. Um, yeah, so it wasn't an initial uh, desire to study law. It was really something that I came to and, and really spoke to me once I embarked on the legal journey, so to speak. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And when we talk about journalism and law and making a change, where do you see overlaps of the two of them and where you, do you see distinct differences between journalism and law? I think that they're mutually reinforcing in many ways, particularly when you're working in the public interest sector and a lot of the work that you do or a lot of the work that public interest attorneys do um, is to a large extent dependent on the campaigns that surround that work. I mean, it's, it, you know, a lot of a lot of activism really gets its voice through journalism, through media pieces and through journalists who are willing to engage with topical subjects like law reform and like social and environmental justice. Um, so I think the two work hand in hand. I mean, us as lawyers, it's it's one thing to to launch an impactful case and um, to try and bring about societal change, but it's really around the advocacy and the giving that case a voice and building a social movement around the cause in question um, that I think, as I say, journalism and law are, are, are two very necessary tools to achieve desired change. Kate, you're the co-founder and the executive director at the Biodiversity Law Center, which is based, as you said, in Cape Town. And I would like to read the purpose of the company to our audience, and it reads the following. We are activist lawyers who seek to use the law to protect and restore ecosystems in Southern Africa. By partnering with communities and other civil society organizations, we provide legal advice and support in order to achieve our vision of flourishing indigenous species and ecosystems that support sustainable livelihoods in Southern Africa. And my first question on that, Kate, is what is it that made you pivot from a career in a private practice towards becoming an environmental lawyer? To sort of refine that a little bit, I, I was an environmental lawyer in private practice, um, and I, I am still one. It was really just the means of practicing law that I wanted to change. I've I've always had a passion for biodiversity, but I did find that working in the private sector, your capacity to take on or to have discretion over the work that you take on is a little bit limited by the fact that you're essentially driven by work that pays legal fees and covers the firm's running costs. So it was really in pursuit of 
my passion for biodiversity and an opportunity that came along to establish a biodiversity law center that I pivoted um, into this particular field of work. And how has the motivation changed or how are you now more capable, more eligible to choose your cases, to select your cases if you talk to that? How to describe, I don't want to like give you a huge long answer because I could go really down a rabbit warren in this one. <laughs> but I mean, so the first guiding principle for really the kind of work that we take on is whether or not the organizations and the communities that we support have the legal funds to to pay for legal services. Um, if they do, then then that's not work that we can really take on because the whole point of the Biodiversity Law Center is to provide that legal support to um, nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations that, that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford legal fees. Um, and there is no other law clinic operating in Southern Africa that is able to provide services to the conservation sector and to communities um, wanting to protect their biodiversity for free. So. This, this, the center strategy is largely informed by ecological considerations and considerations of communities that operate in particular ecosystems as well as other stakeholders. So, I mean, the center is incredibly new. We've only been around for a year. Um, the new board was appointed in April last year and I was appointed as executive director. And it's really only since then that we've been up and running. But one of the main strategies which I'm busy working on at the moment is identifying strategic focus areas for the center's work. And this really involves finding that nexus between science and law, where we identify ecosystems um, or key environments, uh, ecosystems based on key biodiversity areas, and look at the levels of species endemism within those areas and what the threats are who the existing stakeholders in that particular area are and whether law is the appropriate tool to address threats and to take advantage of opportunities to promote flourishing indigenous ecosystems and species. So it's really the development of the strategy that informs the work that the center is able to take on, which makes it so unique. Can you provide a few examples of cases or of ideas that you pursue? I can certainly give you a few examples. Um, I mean, the center primarily is a legal support center. So um, I'm currently working with a handful of NGOs providing advice around endangered marine, sorry, endangered seabird species uh, in Southern Africa and just some advice on possible legal interventions to deal with plummeting populations of these species and the various drivers of biodiversity loss affecting these species. Um, I'm also involved with another organization seeking to protect a Ramsar wetland on the west coast of South Africa, which is under significant pressure from over abstraction and degradation within the greater catchment. And it's impacting not only the ecological functioning of the wetland, but also the socioeconomic benefits uh, that are derived by communities living in proximity to this particular site. So those are just the two of the projects um, that I'm currently working on. We are a very small team and by very small, I mean, I am the only employee at this point. Um, so definitely looking to expand within the coming year and the more people we have on board, the more work we're able to do. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to having a new recruit join, which is going to happen imminently, because I think that's going to really expand our capacity to do impactful work in line with the center's vision and strategy. I don't know if there even is an answer to the upcoming question, but how long would such cases usually go? Is it a couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years? If we talk about ecosystems, it's very complex systems, right? So is there any rule of thumb that it's larger, longer cases, or is there anything that you can share with us in regard to that? Oh, it depends on so many factors. And I think you you hit the nail on the head from the, from the outset. It depends on the system itself that you want to protect or restore. It, it depends on the objective of the legal intervention, if law is even the most appropriate way of addressing a particular problem or threat. 
And then it turns on, is this a question of law reform? Is it a question of advocacy? Is it a question of litigation? What is the legal tool that you want to actually employ in order to bring about the desired change? Because, I mean, a court case can take many years. There's multiple stages from high court to Supreme Court to constitutional court if the issue um, requires that. So it's very difficult um, in the abstract to talk about how long something could take. I mean, it also depends on, as I say, the outcome that you want to achieve. Like, What is it about this particular species in terms of population numbers or an ecosystem in terms of ecological factors that you want to see restored? What is the, what is the actual outcome of the intervention? Really determine how long the change takes perfect sense. Thank you very much for that answer. And Kate, you said that the Biodiversity Law Center is somewhat unique, at least in South Africa, meaning that there are not many companies with a similar structure, with a similar um, fee structure, especially around. And I would like to understand, is that a demand or a supply question? So my first question would be, are there sufficient cases to be made in Southern Africa, do you believe, to create a much bigger yeah, demand for the services that you create? I think, I think the supply is going to be endless. I think we are in a developmental state, particularly South Africa. I think that there are going to be increasing pressures on biodiversity as population grows, as people's shift in terms of migratory patterns driven by climate change, driven by need. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more drivers or the drivers of biodiversity loss are going to become a lot more accentuated in the coming years. And those, of course, are climate change, pollution, overexploitation of species, land and sea use change, and the impact of invasive species. I think all those five factors are only increasing and humans are only putting more and more pressure on the planet. Um, and we see it all the time. I mean, there is what I think is a false dichotomy between sustainable development and environmental protection. And I think it's unfortunate that in South Africa, these two aspects are often put in conflict with each other when really we should be looking at the fact that biodiversity underpins huge, I mean, it underpins most of what people do what people rely on, the, eco the ecosystem services on which all life depends. So it's really not a question of environmental protection versus development. It's looking at protecting the environment will enable development. Um, and I think so that's something that's often lost sight of. So I think that, as I said, there's, there, there's going to be and there is increasing pressure on natural systems in Southern Africa. And I don't think there will be any shortage of supply of cases that need to be taken on. How much of a niche is it to be an environmentalist lawyer or an activist lawyer at this point in time in Southern Africa? Still quite niche, but I think with the growing climate crisis and growing recognition of the biodiversity crisis as well, that there is definitely an increased interest in the field. Um, and I've certainly seen over the number of years that I've been in practice a growing number of um, not only environmental lawyers in the field, but also environmental organizations. Um, so there are other activist lawyers working in the space and increasingly we're seeing the rise of more issues that are intersectional, for example, um, big exploration for oil and gas off the coast of South South Africa, both in the Cape and off the eastern provinces coastline, there's increased exploitation or, or desire to exploit oil, for example, oil and gas reserves off the South African coastline. And these kinds of cases are being picked up by activists that are not strictly or haven't historically been involved in environmental cases, but because of the impact on ocean biodiversity that exploration might result in. Increasingly, lawyers who haven't traditionally been environmental lawyers per se are entering the fray on environmental issues because of the way they intersect with issues related to community livelihoods, 
to cultural heritage and to climate change. And I suppose, and that's an assumption, but because they also feel the pressing urge to do something about it, right? So they may also pivot or at least focus on particular cases. And just out of curiosity, Kate, is becoming an environmental lawyer something that you can study? Do you put your focus there? I'm asking because in business, yes, you can not by now study sustainability, you can study more ecosystem, biodiversity, business, what those studies really are is a different conversation. But how is the education system in South Africa, or maybe even globally in regard to that? Well, I think generally, it's a, it's a common trajectory, you go and study a law degree and then specialize at master's level in environmental law. And I think there are many, many universities all over the world which offer fantastic master's programs. So yes, it's definitely something that you can specialize in um, after obtaining a general law degree. We've talked about biodiversity quite a bit already. And you wrote an article and it's called biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate and business needs to care. And the article is from December 2022 and I would like to read a paragraph from it. The abundance of monitored wildlife populations around the world has declined by an average of 69% between 1917 and 2018. This is code red for the planet and humanity. The crisis is not just taking place within the confines of the conver conservation sector, it funda fundamentally affects business. And my first question on that is, what does the biodiversity decline mean for individuals in South Africa, but also globally? Oh, Ismail, I think that's a really large question. Um, I think it's the decline in biodiversity affects people on every level, um, from individual to business. It's just such an enormous problem. Um, I mean, if you think about it, people are dependent on nature for absolutely everything that we rely on. And that, that's not just food, water, it's also regulating services. So when we talk about biodiversity, I mean, what we're really talking about is all different kinds of life that you find in an area. It's the variety between species, between ecosystems, and even at a genetic level, the biodiversity that you find. And biodiverse ecosystems are naturally more resilient. Um, and I think that the services that we are dependent on, the, the, both the goods and services that humanity is dependent on, um, are derived from having biodiverse ecosystems. And I'm talking provisioning services the fact that we can get food and crops and timber and clean water from the environment, but also the regulating services like soil production, climate regulation, clean air. These are all things that are fundamental to our everyday lives as individuals. And I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's not something that is important only for individuals. I think there are different levels at which it becomes important, but I think that there's a bit of a dissociation between all these services that we rely on and perhaps the way business conceives of biodiversity and thinking that they're not actually that dependent because their services or, or the business, the nature of the business that they're involved in is not strictly dependent on natural ecosystems or is a little bit removed from direct dependence on those ecosystems. So I, I've strayed a little bit on your question, but I think that I really think that, you know, loss of biodiversity is important to people because it underpins absolutely everything we do and absolutely everything that we rely on. Mm. And how would you argue is the understanding of what you just outlined, this dependence on nature in society? on an individual, but also on a collective level, and also for business, because yes, you and I probably do agree that we depend on nature for so many things. And the question is, are people aware of the dependence on nature, or is that something that is changing over time? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's definitely something that's growing. And I mean, it also depends on who you ask, because I mean, if you speak to someone who is a member of 
uh, who is an indigenous personal member of a local community, I think the answer would be quite different to an investment banker on Wall Street um, who is very removed from the natural world. I mean, when we talk about dependencies on nature, we can think about it in terms of the people who live with nature, who have a harmonious coexistence with the natural ecosystem, both in terms of what they derive from nature, as well as the cultural and spiritual ties that they have to their environments. And I think there's growing recognition, certainly globally, of, of the importance of those relationships and that we're not seen as distinct from nature, but really we are part of it. Um, and I think um, it's just from a business perspective, I don't think, I think that there's perhaps less understanding and emphasis on the role of nature in business, particularly if you look at businesses far down the supply chain, as I say, you mentioned financial services and think about the kind of business that that sector involves. It's not, you don't automatically think about nature dependencies because it's, you know, you're working in an office and you're far from any natural ecosystem. But if you look at, if you start drilling down into the nature of those services and the supply chains, or perhaps the underlying assets and companies that are invested in, and you start looking at what those companies are doing in terms of impacts on biodiversity and the risks, dependencies and opportunities in that context, then it becomes a lot more real and certainly business should be paying a lot more attention to the, the risks and impacts of biodiversity or on biodiversity. Is it important then to somewhat reconnect business or business leaders or business people with nature? And if so, how can we do that? I think it is so important and it's such a difficult question about how it can be done because and, and, and I think this is where law plays such a fundamental role and especially, you know, there are movements such as the movements for the rights of nature and earth jurisprudence, which completely reconceptualize the way we think about nature and our role in it. Um, you know, it really goes back to principles of the earth should that should have rights in and of itself, the natural species and ecosystems that should be granted legal personhood in order to have rights, not just as resources to be used by humans, but as intrinsic rights of their own. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of movement in that space, but I mean, that's, that is, you know, not the way the legal system is currently framed, but I certainly think that law still has an important role to play in transforming societal perceptions and expectations in relation to nature. I mean, if you introduce, you, you know, as is on the table in a few jurisdictions, laws around environmental and human rights due diligence, then you'll see that there is there is a growing trend towards recognizing impacts on nature. And um, I mean, it is it is such a difficult question. I, I don't have the answer, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I want to say get CEOs out there, get them experiencing nature. Okay, that's, oh, sorry, that's what I was actually getting to with the human rights and environmental due diligence stuff. Because I think if you do conduct those inquiries and you actually look at how your operations affect biodiversity at all levels of the supply chain, I think it gives a much greater picture of your relationship to biodiversity as an organization, not just um, as something quite removed from it and from the natural world. So I think that there is going to be a growing awareness among business and among industry around dependencies and impacts on biodiversity. Um, how does that affect individuals working within those businesses? I mean, ideally, one would want to see a shift away from just seeing protection of biodiversity as a way to to sort of improve the bottom line. Um, it would be great if people could actually transform the way they think about nature and um, think about it more in terms of the part of the ecosystem that we play rather than just our need for the ecosystems to be extracted and exploited for human benefit. Mm. So basically what I hear is one way would be to make the impact of one's business activities on the biodiversity more transparent so that people would supposedly take different decisions. And probably that also links back to what we discussed very early in this conversation with journalism and law. So once it becomes transparent and company A or company B or company C does not change something or individual leader does not change something, 
journalist and activist can pick that up because they actually have the clear cut data. Is that something that you're advocating for? Absolutely. I think I think the information that we have will enable interested parties to hold companies to account. And like I say, ideally, you want everyone in the world to have their, their thinking shifted to a reconceptualization of the relationship with nature. But at the very least, if we're talking about the bottom line and we're talking about um, looking at environmental impacts and dependencies and what impacts businesses actually have, um, I do think that having increased information and increased scrutiny of business practices will go a long way in improving our relationship with nature. I mean, you can't fix what you don't know, essentially. So it's really through having due diligence procedures. And I mean, we've just seen in um, at the end of 2022 at the Convention on Biological Diversity's Conference of the Parties, um, which was hosted in Montreal, the Global Biodiversity Framework came about, which is a fantastic document with 23 targets that are aimed to address biodiversity loss globally. And I mean, one of the targets is um, for contracting parties to take legal action or take legal and administrative policy measures um, to encourage and enable business to regularly report on and monitor their impacts, dependencies, risks, and opportunities in relation to biodiversity. And I think having that codification of that requirement in international law is going to be so powerful in driving not only national laws to develop rules and regulations that implement that target, um, but it's going to go such a long way in making sure that businesses operate more transparently. And I mean, the minute you have information, you can you can act, activists can act, you can do something with it. And I mean, we've seen just in the climate space with the recent um, court action being brought by Client Earth in relation to Shell, where directors are being held personally liable under company law in the UK for failure to implement proper climate change risk management measures. And I mean, that's a that's the I mean, it's the first case of its kind and it's very far reaching. And there's nothing to say that in the biodiversity space, something similar couldn't come about. So once you have the information about the impacts that companies are having, and I'm talking about also managing biodiversity risk, because it's not just about the, the physical risks in as much as, you know, a company that's directly dependent on nature and ecosystem services no longer has access to them because they've been destroyed. But you're also talking about transition risks, which are risks that come about as regulations change and you shift towards a different economy, um, as well as reputational risks that can come about if consumers change their behavior and change their way of thinking about biodiversity and a company in question is still implementing unsustainable practices. I mean, all of these are, are risks that need to be disclosed. Um, and really through greater disclosure, there will, I think, be an upsurgence in legal action around failure to take proper measures to mitigate these risks. And Kate, when you talked, we a little bit earlier mentioned that nature in certain countries is becoming a legal entity. And I would be very interested, I don't know if you want to speak for Southern Africa or if you want to speak for the global trend. Where do you see that movement? And is it going quick? Is it going slow? Are there certain yeah, leaders in that spectrum that you would like to highlight? How could that change the structure by which you have levers to play with, with law in that regard? Oh, I'm definitely not the best person to ask this. I wish my colleague or my, my former colleague, Cormac Cullinan, and one of the directors of the Biodiversity Law Center was on this call because he would certainly be able to enlighten you much more, much better than I would. But I think that it's a trend that is certainly gaining um, more attention globally. It's not something that's mainstreamed yet, although there are organizations such as the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature that are really bringing this movement to the fore. And I mean, there are jurisdictions where we have seen nature assuming legal rights. Um, for example, the, the Constitution of Ecuador expressly confers rights on Mother Nature 
in and of herself. Whereas if you compare that to the constitution of South Africa, our environmental right is framed that everyone has the right to an environment that's not harmful to health and well-being. But that's essentially an, an anthropocentric way of viewing things because the right is still in relation to people and not nature itself. Um, but I mean, in, in New Zealand, we've seen the Wanganui River also receive legal personhood, which just changes, it changes the way you, I mean, it, it becomes a legal entity in as much as it can sue, it can it can bring legal action in, um, in its own name, on its own accord. It doesn't need to be for the benefit of people or for the preservation of ecosystems for human purposes. It's really about the intrinsic value of nature and protecting that right that it has to exist, to persist, to flourish of itself. Those are examples on an, let's call it governmental or like on a national level. Are there other examples that come to mind for good or bad behavior um, in that regard in on a company or on a business level that you would like to highlight? I'm not aware of any examples, certainly not from a rights of nature perspective. I don't think it's it's something, and I mean, I stand corrected, but I don't think there's been any company that's changed their interrelation with a natural environment on the basis of thinking that it has rights and intrinsic rights to exist and persist. I, I don't, I'm not aware of any, no. Okay. Are you hopeful that something like that will be created in the short or midterm? It would be interesting to see how that would play out legally. Um, I mean, it would involve a company affording a degree of respect to nature and, you know, rights of nature in and of itself and not in relation to individual people. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that we're quite a long, if I understand correctly, I think we're quite a long way from, from that. Mm. And I suppose I know the answer to the question already a little bit because we talked about that, but do you think the driving factor would be from within businesses to change something or would it be really from law and from creating new policies in order to drive that change towards yeah, a more ecocentric or ecosystem including perspective and way of yeah, conducting business? It's so interesting, Ismail, because I really think this goes to the heart of the power of law and legal principles, because I think law is, it's an interesting creature. It's both responsive to societal change as well as a driver of societal change. Um, and those two sometimes push and pull against each other. Um, I mean, if just thinking about societal change that has driven progression in the LGBTQI space and recognition of rights of persons who who identify other than heterosexual. I mean, it's it's a huge it's it's the law that actually responded to societal change that pushed the law in that direction. And then it kind of takes on a life of its own where the law now mandates behavior in a particular way. Like you you have these far reaching constitutional rights to equality, which are the product of societal change. So I think in the case of the rights of nature and a more ecocentric approach, there is a groundswell uh, of recognition that that what we need is transformative change. I mean, to a large extent, the current legal systems aren't actually working. Um, I mean, even as someone who operates within the parameters of the law in South Africa, it's, it's not ideal. I mean, biodiversity is still being eroded at an alarming rate. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the report they released in 2019 found that at least a million species face extinction unless something rapid is done to, to turn this around. And I think that in light of this biodiversity crisis and the recognition that perhaps the way we're doing things is not actually the best way, and this might be a driver towards a legal system, and it might not be soon, but it's certainly incrementally happening towards a legal system that just affords a different way of thinking about our relationship with nature and a more ecocentric way, um, which recognizes the rights of nature.
No, absolutely. And I would be very interested in the transformation of this, well, society, but also this underlying legal structure. So let's suppose that companies or governance would basically agree upon what we've just said, that biodiversity should be at the forefront and such. And I just know very little about legal structures on a national, on an international level. But how fast or what could be first steps of such a legal change? Because I believe this is also very ingrained structures that are not changed overnight. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's, it's, as I say, it's slow and it's incremental and it's brought about by increasing pressure from society to actually implement the kind of legal reform or advocate for the kind of legal reform that's necessary. And I think, I mean, if I think about South Africa, I mean, and it's very diff difficult to comment across all jurisdictions because so many, every country in the world has a different legal system. So how they'd really bring this about is, but I mean, what we generally see is an amendment to the constitution to really include a right that nature has a right of itself and not framed in the anthropocentric way that South Africa's environmental right is framed, that it's a right to health, to a healthy environment to all people. Um, but it's really that intrinsic ecological ecocentric right. Um, and that, I mean, it, it cascades down. If you have that as a constitutional provision and perhaps the first step would be recognition at an international level by a body like the United Nations General Assembly. I mean, they only recently recognized the right to a healthy environment for people. <laughs> so I think we're quite away. Yeah, that was in July, July 2022 that the UN General Assembly recognized that right. I mean, it's it, there are a lot of domestic constitutions that already contain that right. But to have it recognized on an international level really creates greater impetus towards its implementation by governments. So, I mean, I think that ideally, if you if, you, we, if we wanted the kind of transformative change that society probably needs, it would come from a global or international level first and then cascade down to domestic constitutions or domestic laws. But I mean, that's a huge change we're talking about. And there are certainly many very competent, very good people working towards that kind of a system. But it's it's a way to go still. And that is somewhat of a top down approach. And I do agree that this was definitely help if we would have agreement on an international level and that then kept cascade down into different countries and this, yeah, your restrictions, as you said. Are there also good examples of the bottom up? Is that then basically what you are doing in your everyday job that you create those bottom up cases, case by case examples on how to change something? And this is the two that we have to connect after all? Difficult to say, Ismail, because I mean, I would love to say that I do that on a day to day basis, but I'm still working within the parameters of the laws that exist right now. Um, and I'm largely constrained. I mean, South Africa has a very robust environmental legal system. I mean, there are certainly problems with compliance and enforcement with it, but we have very progressive environmental legislation. Um, but those are the tools in the toolkit at this point in time. Um, and while there are fantastic organizations like the Wild Law Institute who are working on advocating for the kind of systemic change that we're talking about here, um, somebody has to deal with the problems as they're arising now with the tools that are currently available. And that's what I do on a daily basis. If we talk about systemic change, I think we talked about the legal structure quite a bit. And earlier you mentioned the role of the consumer. And I would also like to discuss with you the power of a consumer of buying goods, of buying services, or of neglecting to buy or consume goods and services. What role do you think plays the consumer in all this? I think a fundamental role. I mean, there are many parts that make a whole, but you cannot develop a movement without individuals taking action. I think it's so important that people, and I mean, this is where the advocacy component and going back to what we were saying earlier about journalism um, is so important, is bringing information to the people so that they have 
what they need to make decisions about the patterns of consumption that they that they use. Um, and I, I just think that there's so much power in individual action, really. Everyone has the capacity to make small changes. And I think that that's how business is driven. Business is driven by the bottom line. They're driven by what people want and what they don't want. Look at what's happened with straws. I mean, a few years ago, you could get a straw at any restaurant. Now it would be insane to sit there with a plastic straw, given the impact that we know they cause. And it's just that kind of incremental change that is really possible from a personal level when people have the information that they need to make those kind of decisions. Mm, no, I definitely do agree. And I always like to highlight the power that each of us has, right? You, I, and everybody else who's listening with our consumption or with our non-consumption and with our adaption of such. And I don't know if the time frame from 2011 to 20, 2023 is the right one, but if we talk about individual changes and you can use those 12, 13 years, or you can say over the past five years, past three years, is there something that you have changed in regard to your personal behavior if it comes to the ecosystem, if it comes to the nature that you would like to share with us that was either difficult or maybe that was really easy for yourself or somebody told you something and that made sense for you. I don't know if something comes to mind. I mean, I've done a lot of things in my personal life to just try and make my footprint on the world a little bit smaller. Um, I mean, obviously what I do for a living, being an environmental lawyer and, and working in the biodiversity space is I mean, it's inherent, it's it's the whole way I do business, the way I live my life that's informed by the relationship that I want to have with nature and that I think people should have with nature. I mean, of course, they're like micro changes that I've made over the years, cutting down on single use plastic, cutting down on consumption of meat. Um, and it's, it's those kind of small changes that also I do believe make a difference, especially when everyone's doing them. So, yeah, this, I hope that answers your question. Um, no, certainly does. Thank you very much. And the other major question that I have in regard to that is like, yeah, we have a power of being a consumer, but what power or what enablement do we have as being a citizen and having voting rights, if that makes any sense? I think, that, again, the power is huge. And I think this is something I, I wish I could see more of in South Africa is political parties with a biodiversity agenda. Um, I think we're so mired with so many other systemic problems that the environmental crisis is often one that is overlooked. Um, and I haven't to date seen any political party that really has an environmental manifesto that excites me. Um, and it would be really great to see that because that's where my voting power would lie. But at the moment, I will. I, I just, I think people do have enormous power to vote in political parties that advocate a particular agenda and that want to bring about change. Um, yeah, whether they exist or not is another thing. And whether there's enough attention being given to pressing environmental issues is a whole other story. So yeah, what I hear is that being a citizen of Southern Africa, but of any country really, enables you with the power and also the right to participate and to, yeah, create in a way something that we are urging for, right? The transformational change of society. And if we talk about systematic change, and earlier we talked about the dependence on nature for society and for business. What do you think is it that many people maybe do need to understand or do not yet fully understand connecting the dots? So if we talk about systematic change and the dependence on nature, um, what are the building blocks that maybe are not so much in the focus, if that makes any sense? One is to sort of summarize the problem. It's that people have become completely disconnected from the natural world. And it's just a whole ideological shift is really necessary to reorient that relationship and bring awareness to the reliance that we were talking about earlier. Because at the moment, I think it's very hard to care about something that you feel is removed from you. It's a lot more 
it's a lot easier to care about something when it's when it's front of mind, when it's present, and when you're aware of it. So I just think that people, I think that there's a general discord between people and the natural world. And somehow we have to reignite that connection. Somehow we need to bring people back to nature so that they understand the impact that they can have in their everyday lives on natural systems. Kate, there are a couple of questions that I ask each and every of my podcast guests. But before we go there, is there any topic or theme that you deem we haven't discussed in good detail today and where you would like to shine a little bit of light? I think that our conversation has covered a broad range of very interesting topics, <laughs> probably each of which I could speak about for a good hour. But I, I'm, I'm not going to go down that rabbit warren now. I think we've covered everything. Thank you very much. And I believe it's always good to have a reason to come back and to go for such deep dives. But with that, Kate, there are three questions. And the first one is, what is it that makes you hopeful? I'm always inspired, especially being in a country where we face a number of political issues, especially corruption of the state, incompetence in certain spheres of government and failure to deliver on constitutional promises. But there are people working on the ground who bring about the most amazing change. And I'm always inspired by looking at other activists and the hours of work that is put in to bringing about positive impacts on society. And that's really something that makes me hopeful is that notwithstanding the fact that we are sitting with stage six load shedding in South Africa and notwithstanding the corruption allegations that litter our media every day, we can still look to the people working on the ground, fighting for various causes, not just environmentals, but across the board. And that really gives me hope that, that people are, to a large extent, the solution and that people will be able to drive transformative change in society putting things into action, basically, and a big shout out to all the activists in Southern Africa and globally. And I believe that links nicely to the second question that I have, and that is, Kate, who are your mentors or whom do you personally look up to? Oh, that's such a tricky one. <laughs> I mean, there's so many people that I respect and admire for so many different reasons. Um, I think I would like to pull the characteristics of each of them into a mega person. <laughs> I mean, I'm so inspired by the work of my fellow environmental attorneys. There are other organizations that have been around a lot longer than the Biodiversity Law Center doing such incredible work. Um, the attorneys, for example, at the Center for Environmental Rights really championing climate change litigation in South Africa. Um, organizations like All Rise Attorneys who are also fighting hard for the rights of communities affected by rampant mining expansion in KwaZulu-Natal province. So it's, it's, it's people who, are, who have the capacity to really see their lawyering as more than just a job and really put in the work and have the passion to help society and to to bring positive change mm, absolutely thank you very much for mentioning that and again a big shout out to each and everybody mentioned and non-mentioned who has this passion to change something towards the better in society in their micro or in their macro environments and that kate leads us to the last and final question for today's episode anyways and it's a rather hypothetical question, and I call it the three truths. And I would like you to imagine that you're traveling all by yourself in space, actually for quite some time, could be a couple of days, could be a couple of months, and it could even be a couple of years. And after all that solo travel, you encounter a human-like species, but they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What is it that you tell them? What do I tell a human-like creature about humanity? 
that we are incredibly resilient as human beings, that we have the capacity to adapt and to change. And we've been through millennia of adaption and change, and we've come out on the other side and that we have enormous resilience and the capacity to really deal with and address the environmental and sociological crises of our times. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Kate. And thank you also for being a guest on the Just Another Mindset podcast. And that said, if there is any final message or last words for today's podcast episode, it's all yours. I just want to say thank you very much for this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. It's always great having the opportunity to talk about the Biodiversity Law Center and the work that we're doing. So thank you very much for approaching me and for this opportunity. Thank you. If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.